Okay. Welcome, folks. I know we're running a little late. We were waiting for some folks to sign on, and then we had to deal with some logistics of um, getting the, the draft legislation out to folks. And also, we're going to be sharing our screen with the proposed draft. So we've been um, <clears throat> working with the commissioner of DOC, along with our legal staff, legislative council, to do a, a draft. And I want to reiterate, this is a draft. It is the first time that we have put any of these recommendations from Downs, Rackland, and Martin um, onto a piece of paper for us to take a look at. It is not written in stone, as I have just mentioned to the committee. Uh, we will do our due diligence uh, in taking testimony on this, as well as working with our respective committees that have jurisdiction over some of the pieces, be it the House Government Operations Committee, as well as the House Judiciary Committee. Um, so this is our first walkthrough of the language and um, I'm gonna turn it over to our legal counsel, Damian Leonard, to get us started. And Damian, I know that there's probably gonna be questions as you go along. Would you prefer the questions to happen as we go along or at the end of the sections that you're gonna be covering? I think each section is pretty short. So if we can hold the questions till the end of the section, then I can just answer them all at once. Okay. Great. So I'll turn it over to you. And whenever you speak for the first time, please identify yourself for the record. Okay, will do. My name is Damian Leonard. I'm from the Office of Legislative Counsel. Uh, and Phil, when you are ready, if you could throw up the draft there, if we can scroll down to section one, which starts on line 14 of page one there. Uh, this is uh, an exception from our Polygraph Protection Act here in Vermont. So generally employers are prohibited under both state and federal law um, from requiring applicants uh, or employees to take a polygraph. Um, what this bill would do if we can scroll down to the stop, top of page two is federal law provides an exception for uh, federal, state and local employees uh, and in Vermont, we've narrowed that uh, under existing law to employees of the Department of Public Safety, uh, or I'm sorry, to applicants for jobs with the Department of Public Safety, applicants for law enforcement positions with Department of Motor Vehicles and Fish and Wildlife, uh, applicants for investigator positions, which are also a law enforcement position with Liquor and Lottery and the Board of Liquor and Lottery, and then municipal police departments and county sheriffs as to sworn police officers and deputies. Uh, what this would add on line five is the Dep Department of Corrections. I'm sorry, I'm not sure why I'm tongue tied this afternoon uh, for applicants for correctional officer positions. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty simple addition there. Obviously the question of the policy questions here are probably bigger than the language questions. And uh, I, I'm sure you've all read the uh, Downs Rackland report at this point and heard other testimony that I haven't been privy to, but this would allow uh, DOC to um, uh, use a polygraph with applicants for the correctional officer positions before they uh, decide to hire them. Any questions? So I have a question here in terms of just clarifying what is allowed under the federal law for public so free and the, the federal law uh, provides an exemption um, for federal, state, and local, uh, local government employers to uh, use a polygraph with either employees or applicants um, and to also use the results of a polygraph. Uh, it also provides those exemptions for national security contractors, um, ongoing investigations of an action that resulted in economic loss, such as theft or embezzlement, um, and then prospective employees of armored car security alarm and security guard services, 
as well as employees who manufacture, distribute, and dispense controlled substances subject to certain restrictions on several of those. Um, but the controlled substances, so as if it's covered by the Federal Controlled Substances Act, um, then you can be subject to a, a polygraph examination there. In Vermont, we've limited ours to the law enforcement officers I mentioned, as well as wholesalers and retailers of precious metals, gems, and jewelry. I am not sure if that exemption would still fit in with the federal law. Um, we may be preempted there. And then also the manufacture, distribution, and sale of controlled substances. Uh, and then any employers who are authorized or required by federal law, which would include national security contractors, um, as well as the federal government. So um, that's our current exemptions. This would add the correctional officers to the list of law enforcement employees who are permitted to uh, undergo a polygraph when they're an applicant for employment. So Damien, it seems like when the law was originally put in, um, the current law for Department of Public Safety applicants and motor vehicles and fish and wildlife, under the federal um, law, it would allow federal, state, and local government employees to um, be subject to a polygraph examination if you're applying for a position within any of those entities, correct? That's correct. So we are abiding by that, by um, section one. That's right. So we're, this is consistent with federal law. Uh, the way this, like many other federal employment statutes, a good way to think of it is it sets the floor mm -hmm. and then states are free to go above and beyond. Uh, and so what Vermont has done is it's narrowed it to applicants for certain law enforcement positions within uh, state and local government. And then this would be adding to that list within uh, state government there, um, but not, uh, it would not be violating the federal law here because these are again, state employees. So when this law was originally put in on the Vermont side, this carve out for the, the certain DOC, obviously <clears throat> was not part of the conversation or people didn't think about it. Do you know when section one was put in with the Department of Public Safety and Motor Vehicles and Fish and Wildlife? I can get you that answer in just a minute here. So. And also those are all positions of law enforcement except for the uh, Board of Liquor in lottery, which is investiga investigators. <clears throat> Although it's it's worth noting, those are sworn law, enfor law enforcement officers as well. Yeah, um, that's what I wanted to bring up. Yeah, yeah so they, they have a, a relatively narrow um, jurisdiction, but they're all uh, level three sworn law enforcement officers. So I am uh, just pulling up for a here. So it was added in 1985, so uh, 35 years ago now. And I do not remember when the Federal Polygraph Protection Act was added. Um, and let's see, this was actually, it was added in 1985 and then it was updated in 2001 and 2009. And then again in 2019, but the 2019 update was just changing the Department of Liquor Control to the Department of Liquor and Lottery. Um, I don't know how substantive the 2001 and 2009 amendments to that section were. So I just wanna put this out to the committee for thought. Um, all of these law enforcement positions, they all have to go through some form of training and it's usually at the academy in Pittsburgh. So correctional officers also have to go through training as well. And that is not at the police, that's not at the academy in Pittsburgh. Um, DOC does their own training of their correctional officers. 
and correctional officers are not deemed to be law enforcement officers. There is a definition of correctional officers later on in the statute that we refer to. So I just wanna lay the groundwork here for folks. Questions? So I, I would ask for questions from the committee members first, and then I would open it up to our colleagues from Appropriations and Government Operations after that. So are there any questions from the committee members? Um, Karen. Yes, and I'm afraid that I might've missed just that last piece that you said, and that might be the answer to my question. Um, but I'm curious if correctional officer, if that includes um, all staff that supervise folks. No, there's a definition of correctional officers. So it's not all staff. And maybe all, not Mr. all staff, staff that supervise. I feel like that is the piece is staff that supervise inmates. If they supervise within a facility, you have correctional officers one and correctional officers two. So I'm gonna punt this over to Commissioner Baker to get into more of the nuances because you have shift supervisors and you have folks who are working with offenders on their programming and their case management plan. And then you have your field service officers who are supervising out in the field for folks who are on furlough and parole. So Commissioner Baker. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. So Representative, um, I think what you're getting at, um, what we would propose, and as I said, when we first met, we're not prepared to do this. We're just looking for the authorization to do it as we continue to build out our hiring process. So where the polygraph would be applied, just like you do in law enforcement, it's pre-employment, prior to hiring, and prior to going to the academy. So folks go to the academy, they become a corrections officer. Now they could end up in their career anywhere inside corrections, right? But everyone who works inside a facility and supervises and provides oversight to the incarcerated population start out at the Corrections Academy. They start out as a corrections officer at the Corrections Academy and they can be, they're a CO1, then they can get promoted to CO2 and then a shift supervisor and then a security chief inside the facility. Now the superintendents and, and assistant superintendents could in theory be hired from outside the agency or never been to the academy. Does that help? Yes, that helps. So just knowing that starting point piece right. and that everybody goes through that starting point. Right. So here's the other point I think that, that, Rep, that Madam Chair was hitting on is, is the probation and parole officers in the field. Now, we haven't identified them here as being polygraphed because they, they can be hired from the outside as well. But I would propose at some time in the future, if I was still here, I would advocate, and sometimes this does happen, that a probation and parole officer will go through the basic academy before going to the field. So um, if, we, if we were authorized to do this and got to it, I can envision corrections then saying, everyone who's hired, no matter if you're a probation or a parole officer or a corrections officer is gonna go through the academy. Because we're starting to talk about expanding the academy beyond the five weeks that we do now. Although in COVID, we've been condensing it, um, longer days condensed together um, to cut down on the number of days that people are together um, because of COVID. Um, so I'm hoping that helps you understand. The people in the field are in fact supervising individuals that are in the commissioner's custody. So this, this is more complicated than just the correctional officers. Right. Yeah, right. This, there's a lot of layers to this one. So the thinking is you do it more on just the entry level of folks coming in as CO1s. Right. And then right. now once they start working through the system, they could end up being a superintendent, but Correct. they already had that. Now, do you hire someone who's a superintendent that comes from out of state that did not work through the Vermont system to get there? 
And yes, would that, they that, be, that could happen, yes. The would way they be required for a polygraph? Well, I think it's worth I think it's worth having the conversation, right? That's why I, I also think it it's worth having the conversation about do you polygraph probation and parole? Now I don't um, I, you know we, we can get really carried away with like case officers and so on, but I think it's worth the conversation about anyone who runs a facility. Anyone who runs a district office, that could, I mean, a district manager could be hired from the outside, in theory. Does it happen often? No, but it could happen. So it's worth adding probation and parole uh, and language around anyone who's in a supervisory role in a facility. So what is the intent? And I'm asking the commissioner this. Yeah. What is the intent, the purpose of polygraphing an applicant who's applying for a correctional officer's position. What are you hoping to gain from that? Number one, I'm hoping to raise the bar on our hiring process, that it, it re reflects, um, and, and I'll just say this, I mean, we're not police officers, we're not law enforcement officers. But because of that, I, I, I have to be really candid. What I've learned over the last year is, is that Corrections officers don't gain the kind of respect that they deserve. They're, they're, they, they do not get the same level of respect. And sometimes that's because they're not seen as part of the system, but also sometimes some of the conduct that gets reported publicly um, doesn't, doesn't shine well on us. And it's a small number of people that do that. That's number one. Number two, um, we don't need people hired that, that have been involved in undetected crimes. Um, I, I can tell you from my experience of hiring um, police officers over the years, you think you've got someone that's a, a great candidate, they go to polygraph and you find out they were involved in, I had one case in my days at the state police where the individual witnessed the homicide and never reported it. Mm. Didn't commit the homicide, but was at a bar with a friend in the military where that friend committed a murder and never reported it. Those are not the kind of folks that we need working in our system. So that's the second piece of it, is to be able to sort out folks that have backgrounds that their behavior could indicate that they could become a, 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 a challenge working inside a facility. Great, thank you. So I think we have some questions, Commissioner Lynn. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Working here at Northern State for a long time, most of the people who are working probation and parole came from the prison system. Mm -hmm. They started off at the prison, decided they didn't want to go for three shifts and decided mm -hmm. to, to go out to parole. Is that mm -hmm. the true with most of them or are we hiring more I, outsiders? I, no, I think the vast majority, that's the, that's the description representative as my experience. Certainly, Heather can weigh in or Bill can weigh in, but that's my experience. But occasionally, like I know Bill, just before he left district office in Hartford, hired somebody from the outside. That's That happens, but a lot of the folks that are in the offices have, in fact, came through the Corrections Academy. And if, if again, this is not the time to create this, but <laughs> the feedback I get when I talk to staff that went from a facility to an office they think the experience in the facility helps them better understand the job. That's that's what we always thought too. That's what they would tell us as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. So I quickly looked at the participant list and I see Linda has her blue hand up, but if you have a question uh, for committee members first and then it can be opened up to Tanya and Trevor, just show your actual hand because with sharing a screen, I can't see the participants list. So Linda. Okay, thank you. Um, I think my question might be for Damien, but whoever wants to grab it. So it's for the applicants That's the, that I get. Is there going to be a limited use on the results of this? Like, or is it purely just for the hiring process and then it gets, the results get stored or can this be used if there's complaints or so forth going forward? No. I it's, it's just like used in, 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 in law enforcement. 
It's part of, it's not the single factor that decides. It's part of the hiring process and the entire package. And, and it's not used after that. It's a screening device and it's given a certain amount of weight. It doesn't get all the weight, but sometimes what you find out in an exam is that people admit the stuff that's just, you, you can't turn back from. So it would never be used again in the future. And it would be part of a hiring package that gets stored in a file. And it's not meant to be used against people in the future. So if somebody brought a complaint, it wouldn't be brought out and held right. against them. It's purely for screening purposes. Thank That's you. Correct. That's correct. Yeah, and it's worth adding too, there's specific requirements in the statute about the kinds of questions that can be asked. Uh, and um, requirements around the um, when uh, giving giving a, uh, people receiving the exam a copy of uh, the law and the questions that are going to be asked during the examination, uh, with the exception of any follow up questions that become necessary. So there are very specific sort of requirements about what you can and can't ask. For example you can't ask about someone's religious affiliation um, or about their social habits or marital relationship unless it has a direct relationship to their job performance. Um, so and so the, the, you're, you're not just having a, a free-for-all here with the questions that can be asked during a polygraph. <clears throat> okay, any other questions to the committee? Kurt, was that you? That was me. Um, I, well, I couldn't find those. Uh, I looked briefly in the statute. What you were talking about just now, Damien, is that in state law, the restrictions on the questions? Yep. So uh, that's yes. section 21 VSA 494C. Um, and the, the 494s, as uh, I call them, are it's subchapter 5A of chapter five of title 21. It's 494, 494A, and then little little letters all the way down to 494E covers the um, prohibition, the exemptions to the prohibition, the duties of an examiner when they're doing an examination, employee rights and related proceedings, and then penalties for um, violating the provisions. There are is also in Title 26, I can't remember the chapter, but there's a specific licensing requirement for anyone who's a polygraph examiner. Uh, and so they have to meet certain requirements to be licensed to actually perform the examinations under the state law. And a lot of the licensing requirements and practice requirements set out there mirror what's in the employment law. Okay, thank you. Um, yep. Commissioner Baker, perhaps you can can you give me an idea of what uh, such a polygraph test is or is like? Is this a 20 minute, 10 questions or is this an hour and a half of, or freewheeling or I guess it can't be freewheeling because of what we just heard, but can you give me some idea of what, what it is and what it entails? Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not a polygraph operator, but I can give you some sense of, um, normally what happens, I would say hour, hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half. Um, you know, there, there's a device that measures uh, breathing and, and, and uh, blood pressure. Um, and it's, uh, you know, they're almost like a blood pressure cuff goes on an individual. Normally the, the uh, polygraph examiner will ask a series of pre-questions that kind of set a baseline for the examiner. Um, you, know, you know, what's your name, where do you live? Just sets a baseline. Uh, of understanding someone who is not under stress. And um, then there's a series of questions. And what would normally happen in an organization is, is that within that statute, you're gonna ask a series of questions that um, revolve around such things as prior criminal behavior, um, um, you know, honesty and dishonesty, those type of questions. There could be questions about, um, have you ever stole from your employer, for example? And it's not about if they stole from the employer or not. Yeah, I took two rolls of toilet paper out of the supply room. It's the first thing it's about is truthfulness. And the second thing it's about is prior behavior that goes to character. 
Good, thank you. Uh, another question, and we're, I'm trying to understand um, uh, systemic racism too. And it, from my brief research into this, the more um, flexibility you give a person, the more likely or that that might occur. So I, if, for example, if um, a cop is able to pull people over for anything he can think of, then he's given the discretion and sometimes he ends up pulling over more people of color than not. So we wanna make sure that if we give the polygraph operator too much discretion that there isn't the possibility of some sort of, of systemic racism involved. Right. But I guess from what uh, Damien has said, are these the, the guidelines put on the questions enough to prevent that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah I, I absolutely believe so. And we wouldn't, you know, if we were to implement something um, along the lines of pre-employment polygraph, we would make sure that we vet the questions with the partners we're working with now around our equity work. For example, you know, um, Tabitha Moore spent a lot of time with our staff on, on the interview questions for hiring to make sure that we're not opening it up for subjective prejudice in that process, right? So we're already doing that kind of work and I would do the same thing or recommend we do the same thing um, when we work with setting up questions that um, go, go to polygraph examiners. Okay, it, good, thank you. Not, you know, and just to kind of put in perspective, when I ran the state police, the, you know, there's, there, there is controversy around polygraph. And um, I, I used to say to the polygraph operators, they would come up with inconclusive tests all the time. And I have to remind them, we don't, you, you, you shouldn't use the polygraph and the polygraph shouldn't be used for the kind of same level of scrutiny um, that you polygraph um, somebody who carries the nuclear code around with them. You know what I mean? It's a screening tool. It's part of the process. You want to understand a person's truthfulness and character and make sure that you don't, you're not hiring a corrections officer that a year after they're hired, you get a knock on your door and they've been arrested for murder that happened two years prior. Those are the kind of things you're trying to weed out around the character, raise the bar. Once we start raising the bar like this, all ships are gonna, once you rise the tide, all ships are gonna be higher. And so that's the concept behind it. Thank you. So some of these questions are really, really good. And I know that I started off with also asking a lot of questions and I'm looking at the time on a Friday afternoon. So we have to move it along a little bit. And some of these questions, as we start working on the bill, we're going to do a deeper dive as well. Any more questions from the committee members? And then any questions from Trevor or Tanya? I'm good for now. Okay, thank you. Tanya, did you have anything? I do have a quick question. Just, I, I, it's been made pretty clear that um, corrections officers are very different than law enforcement officers, and I'm wondering if there had, and that has created some challenges and has also created the need for for building in some specific things for corrections officers. So I'm wondering if it has been explored or will be explored, moving them under the sort of categorization of law enforcement. So, that that's a great question, right? I, I, I hear. I see Madam Chair with a smile because I not that I've been here this long, Representative, but um, there is no conversation about giving police powers to corrections officers. There is in this bill the conversation about certification and decertification of corrections officers. Much like, you know, we don't certify or decertify corrections officers who have enormous power and control over people in my custody. But, but we license and we will suspend licenses of barbers or plumbers. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not moving and nor do I think our corrections officers should have arrest powers, police powers, but I do think they should be scrutinized and held to a standard that represents the profession that they work in, if that makes sense. Absolutely, thank you for the clarification. You're welcome, ma'am, thank you. 
So we're going to do a lot deeper dive. I know there's probably going to be a lot more questions. So folks can just flag this. Um, and let's move on to drug testing. Great. Pretty easy too. <laughs> yeah, this is, um, this is another good one. Um, so drug testing in Vermont is extremely restricted. Um, typically, uh, you are generally prohibited from uh, administering drug tests to your employees. Um, the subsection A here, you see, um, it says an employer shall not as a condition of employment, et cetera, do any of the following. I omitted that language, but for the committee's benefit here, it says request or require an employee to take a drug test, administer or attempt to administer a drug test to an employee, or request or require that an employee consent in any manner to practice prohibited under this uh, subchapter. Sub, subsection B prohibits random or company-wide drug tests uh, except as required by federal law or regulation. Um, so for those of you uh, who are familiar with it, federal law requires uh, certain drug-free workplaces. There are also drug testing requirements around uh, uh, motor carriers and folks operating trains and, and airplanes and that sort of thing um, for uh, fairly obvious reasons, I think. Um, there, you want to make sure that that population uh, is not operating under the influence. And so the federal law has provided for random drug testing in those instances. Uh, so in that case, the federal law supersedes Vermont law here. It, it preempts Vermont law in those instances, but otherwise random or company-wide or just drug testing in general is prohibited except when there is probable cause to believe that the employee is using or under the influence of a drug on the job. And then only if you also have an employee assistance program set up to provide rehabilitation to an employee who tests positive, you have a provision saying the employee can't be terminated for a positive test unless they have a second subsequent positive test. And then the administration of your test is subject to um, various restrictions in Vermont law after that regarding how the test is administered and what it can test for. So the probable cause means that you have to have a reasonable basis to believe that the employee is using or under the influence, which can be hard for an employer to prove. Um, and so as a practical matter, um, this uh, exception, as I understand it from previous discussions of this in committee, obviously I'm not uh, the operator of a business or, or a state agency, but my understanding from previous testimony is that as a practical matter, this is a rarely used exception because the probable cause standard can be hard for an employer to meet. So with that background, the, uh, what this bill would do, if we can scroll down to page three, uh, is it would say notwithstanding the restrictions in A and B, um, the, uh, Department of Corrections could conduct random or facility-wide drug tests of correctional officers uh, provided they meet the following conditions. And I put these in uh, based on the existing law and it's having an employee assistance program that provides rehabilitation, uh, protection against termination, provided the employee agrees to participate in and successfully complete the employee assistance program but allowing that the correctional officer could be suspended uh, while they're completing the program and then subject to any rights provided pursuant to a collective bargaining agreement, allowing for termination following a subsequent uh, positive drug test after the employee completes rehabilitation and then requiring administration consistent with the chapter. So those conditions I put in uh, are a starting point. They're based on the current probable cause exception, um, but obviously they could be changed. Uh, this was just to make it as consistent as possible with the current drug testing law in Vermont while carving out the ability for the Department of Corrections to do uh, uh, 
random drug testing or facility-wide drug testing that's on a sort of scheduled basis. Uh, any questions? So this is just for COs, is that correct? This is just for COs. And that's based on, uh, that was based on my reading of the uh, Downs Rackland Martin report where they recommended uh, drug testing for correctional officers, if I remember correctly. And this could be done while they're currently employed. It's not carved out for an applicant. No, this is specifically for current employees. I did not modify the restrictions on drug testing applicants. That would be another section. And so if that was something the committee wanted to pursue, we would have to uh, amend the section before this one in the, in the statute as well. Questions, committee members? I don't see any. Alice? Yeah. I have a question. Oh, okay, Sarah and then Linda. Sure. Um, so if I'm understanding it, we're, this, we're just trying to get walk through some of this. But this poses the question to me about whether we wanted um, to widen the folks who are, um, are tested, drug tested um, for people like P and P officers who supervise um, folks. And so Damien, my question would be, would that also require additional an additional section or just could we insert some of that language here if we wanted it to have a broader reach? Um, because in the report, um, it, it didn't seem to be limited at all to corrections officers. Um, so. Okay, that, that may have been um, my misreading of the report there, but yet yeah, you could very easily say, uh, change this from correctional officers to employees of the Department of Corrections. Um, so that without needing to add anything to this, you could substitute another term or terms for correctional officer. Um, and then the, the only thing that you would need to add an additional section for is if you also wanted to test applicants. So uh, in some cases, um, there, there's an interest in testing the applicant before you even get to the point where they're employed in the facility. Um, but the report as I read it was just looking at current employees. Right, yeah. Okay, Thank, that's good clarification. I don't wanna <clears throat> open things up, but I'm, I'm gonna make a note of that actually for, for myself anyway. And for the new members of the committee and also for particularly for Tanya listening in, these are all policy questions that we will do our due diligence to vet. This is a legislative process. This is the process of the committee. This is a, what committees, legislative committees do. This is our work. This is a way of governing and this is what we do. So we've got a couple more questions, Linda and then Scott. Um, thank you, Damien. Um, so my question is to focus more on the random testing um, because what I understand is random, once you random testing, it doesn't go away. So what about the issues with false positives? Like if people are on prescription drugs, like are there carve outs here? How are you going to deal with that? Sure, so uh, that's a really good question. Um, the, I'm sorry, I'm working on two screens here and my cursor is, <laughs> was lost on the wrong screen. Um, the, there are a couple of things that the, the current law provides to protect uh, when you're going down this route. First, um, the uh, drugs to be tested um, are, are set out and specifically listed it. And they're also supposed to be in non-therapeutic quantities or levels. Uh, employers have to have a written policy that identifies the circumstances when a drug test would occur. Um, and also the levels the, that will be screened. Uh, there needs to be a designated la laboratory that's approved by the Department of Health. Um, they have to meet a variety of uh, chain of custody and procedural requirements uh, negative test results, meaning that a 
drug is detected at a therapeutic level um, is not reported to the employer that shows as a negative test. Um, and uh, let's see, there's also a medical review officer uh, who has to be a licensed physician with, no, uh, with knowledge of the use of prescription drugs as well as pharmacology and toxicology of illicit drugs that reviews and evaluates all of the test results um, and then refer, reports only the confirmed test results to the employer after their review. And then finally, uh, employees are allowed to get a retest if they believe that the test results are a false positive. Um, so if they believe, for example, that their sample was contaminated uh, or perhaps mixed up at the laboratory, they can ask for a retest. Um, and my understanding is that they preserve a portion of the sample that can then be subjected to a retest. Um, and there is also in that review process, uh, I believe that would also be an opportunity for the employee to come forward and say, yes, I tested positive for that substance. I'm using it pursuant to a prescription uh, that my doctor has provided. Um, so that, that would provide some safeguards here uh, in the process for employees. I imagine if uh, you do move forward with this, uh, you or perhaps um, uh, you, this committee in consultation with the, uh, the House General Committee might wanna just look at those safeguards to make sure they're sufficient. Thank you very much. Yep. So Damien, let me just ask that question. So all of the procedures and the requirements around the drug testing is developed in the general committee and not judiciary? Uh, in the past, this has been heard in the, the general committees as an employment law. Um, so I, ultimately it's up to the body to decide where the, what committee takes the bill. Um, but yeah, house general might be where you wanna do uh, touch base with the chair there if this moves forward. Um, but for, for folks who are interested, sections 514 and 515 of title 21 uh, cover the whole administration and positive test result procedure. And then subchapter 11 of chapter five of title 21 covers the whole sort of realm of, of drug testing requirements and limitations. Okay. Uh, so we have another question, Scott. Um, Damien, I think you answered this before, but just to clarify, so COs includes everybody except superintendent and, and assistant superintendent. Is that correct? That's not correct. I, I would defer that to the Commissioner Baker. Um, so I know what the definition of CO is in Title 28, but um, the it's not that definition is not specifically referenced here. And that is actually something that's worth highlighting. The committee may want to consider using the Title 10, 28 definition, which is any person employed by the Department of Corrections whose officials, duties, or job classification includes supervision or monitoring of a person uh, on parole, probation, or serving a sentence of incarceration, um, and then who has received training um, as provided later in that title, which I assume is the Corrections Academy. I apologize, corrections is not an area that I know a lot about. Um, or you may wanna define it more broadly to say employees of the Department of Corrections. Uh, I know in the report, there was discussion of uh, allegations related to a supervisor uh, using illicit substances, um, but I don't know if they would fall under this deferent definition of correctional officer or not. Um, so that, that may be a policy issue that the committee wants to dig more deeply into. Uh, and then if you do include this, clearly define uh, what's meant by correctional officer, or use a different term. So oh, Madam Chair, I think, and Representative mm -hmm. Campbell, I think um, it, it's like, you know, when I think of corrections officer, I'm thinking something different than what the statute, the statute outlines, right? Mm -hmm. That second piece of what Damon said is what I would encourage you to be thinking about. 
anyone who's supervising in any role. In fact, in all these pieces, we don't want to leave out anybody. My experience is that since I've been here um, on the personnel investigations, they happen in the facility, they happen outside the facility. So even though we're following the DMR recommendations and reports, I think that last description that you just gave, Damien, is what I was thinking when I came forward with these recommendations. Thank you. Okay. So when, when Damien states um, employees of the department, I think members have to realize employees of the department also means central office in Waterbury. So you're also talking about a lot. You're talking about Heather Simons. You're talking about Bill Soule. You're talking about Monica Weaver. You're talking about all of those staffing as well when you say um, employees of the Department of Corrections. So that's a really broad net that we'd have to figure out. Other questions, Karen? Yes, thank you. And this can just be kind of looking at it from the um, higher level. We don't need to get into the specifics of it, but I'm curious how this language addressed the piece for me, which I heard in the report that it was staff um, making reports or having concerns that there was a um, fellow staff member or supervisor that was using and so wanted to say, like, hey, can we do something about this? And um, I'm understanding that it's tricky with how law is. You can't just assume somebody's using. So in, would this work in that case to address the staff concern though? Cause then would it just be a facility wide? I'm just curious how this meets that need that I feel like was spelled out in the report. So um, just from the, the legal end, what this does is it doesn't change the standard for testing someone where there might be suspected use. Uh, what this does, though, is it provides um, sort of a preventative uh, testing. So the department could implement either, you know, regular uh, testing on a random basis, so uh, which could then discourage use, but it's not going to change that probable cause standard, uh, which, and I, I, beyond reading the report, I know nothing about that uh, particular situation. Um, but in, in my understanding from previous testimony, the probable cause standard has been a difficult hurdle for employers in certain situations because they have, uh, they may have uh, an allegation, but there's no evidence to back it up to give them that reasonable basis to then go forward with the test or not enough evidence to give them a reasonable basis. So, and just taking the word of, of another employee may not provide you with, with that reasonable basis. So this approaches it from a different angle of saying, we're gonna do sort of um, uh, testing to prevent people from using because they're worried that when next month's test comes around, it's gonna still be in their system or they're going to be the one who's called for the random test. Um, Representative, you, you know, without getting into personnel reports that back up that investigation that I've had the benefit of reading, I will tell you in at least one case, there was more than enough probable cause to be able to request a drug test to include erratic behavior and signs of drug use, right? So, but I also want to emphasize to the committee and anyone that's listening, the idea behind this is not to use it. Um, it's good that it's probable cause because that's what it ought to be. You shouldn't go around just testing anyone because you heard a rumor or think. So that's one side of the equation, like Damien said, it's, it's, um, you got to have probable cause. And that's a pretty high standard. The other piece is setting up a random testing that's done very judiciously, um, either through a lottery system or a blind draw of folks. I mean, you set it up so it's blind and it's random and it's, it's uh, you know, equated to what we're doing with COVID testing, right? You're testing, we're testing our facilities now, we're testing the suppress and we're catching tests and preventing it from spreading. I would, I would 
I would use the same analogy. The commissioner actually brings up a good point that um, I forgot to emphasize walking through this. So this allows for, this language allows for random or facility-wide testing. Um, and it's important to note that those are two different things. And if you move forward with this language, you may want to include both or you may want to only include one or the other. Random is like the commissioner said, it's a, it's a blind draw or a lottery where employees are selected at random, but it's only a, a subset of employees. Facility-wide is, is uh, where you would basically say, every employee who's covered by this and working in this facility is getting tested next Tuesday. Um, and so that, that could be, it's a much broader net um, but it may be more intrusive than you want to go. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. And again, this is, as the, the chair has emphasized, is a policy question for you to consider um, as you decide how to proceed on this. So the way you have drafted it now, it's an or. You can do either a random or a facility-wide test. And it, it leaves it up to the, the commissioner's discretion at this point. Um, so you could limit that um, and you could also limit or expand the employees who are covered by this or be more specific as to what you mean by correctional officer. Yeah. Um, and if you don't wanna use the existing Title 28 definition of correctional officer, we can just add in language that says, for purposes of this section, correctional officer means the following. Um, and then you can draft that as narrowly as, as you think necessary to to address um, the uh, particular issues you're, you're looking to address through this. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Damien, for those suggestions. It's well appreciated. Great. Um, Are there any other questions for me? Michael, do you have one? I saw your hand. Yes, up. I do. Okay. Um, yeah, I, it's a commentary, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I heard Commissioner Baker correctly, I believe he was talking about um, the fact that you could also do, uh, or if you had somebody that you were suspect that was having an issue also, did I hear that correctly, Commissioner, or did I hear you incorrectly on that? In addition to these other two categories of random, like Damon said, a lottery and a whole group, you could, have, if you had somebody that was you know, had behaviors that you were suspect. Did I hear that said? Was that what is that a right. But that's representative under this under the language. That's where you would need probable cause in order to do right. the test. Right. Right. And I'm relying on my military experience. We had that ability as commanders. If we I don't know if you had that when you're in the state police force, the same type of ability. But if we had somebody again, because we considered it um a higher standard we were held to as well as a national security interest in the, in the sense with the military. Um, and I would think we would hold these folks in some of the same regard, I guess I could say, and, and uh, would want people that, uh, you know, we're expecting a cut above because you want that it's there. They are um, people that are doing a function that requires a high level of integrity <laughs> and behavior type things, I, if I'm making sense. Yeah, and, and listen, remember, you know, why this is important, and I'll just use facilities. You've got someone under the influence whose job is to maintain safety and security in a facility. That's right. a dangerous right. situation. Absolutely, and people that's, and that's get, what I'm looking at. People can get hurt in a hurry. Absolutely, or hurt somebody else, or endanger somebody else, yeah, correct. or Plus, themselves, it, so. Correct. Plus, if they have an issue with addiction, they are compromised once the incarcerated population figures that out. Yes, yes, sir. And when Absolutely. they figure that out, they own you. And now yes. you compromise security. So my ultimate goal in this is to raise, raise the quality of what we yes. do. But more importantly, if somebody's got an issue, we want to get them help. That's been our emphasis for the last year in corrections is wellness, resiliency, and taking care of staff. You bet, and help and or if they, and if they refuse it or can't get through it or repeat offenders, you need to weed them out. 
Yeah, it is, it's, it's a high risk security business that we're in. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So any other questions from the committee? Tanya, do you have any questions? I saw Trevor has left. Tanya? I do actually, I just wanna, I'm, I'm reading subsection 2A where it says participated successfully in an employee assistance program. And I'm wondering why that doesn't read substance use disorder treatment and if it is in line with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So um, the, the employee assistance program is the paragraph one. Um, and that requires that it is a bona fide rehabilitation program for alcohol or drug abuse. Um, so the uh, rehabilitation plan program has to be provided here. The Americans with Disabilities Act um, does, so substance use disorder is considered a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. There is an important uh, caveat to, though, to that though where um, active use of a substance is not protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So a subsequent positive test um, is not something that's protected by the ADA. Uh, however, if someone were to test positive and rehabilitate, they could not be uh, discriminated against because of their past history of substance use. That is uh, protected, whether it's um, once you're, you're a, uh, a user in recovery, um, that is considered protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, so there's, there's that fine line here where current use is not protected. Um, but if you've gone through rehabilitation, um, you would be protected under the ADA. So, Thank you. This, great. Let's move on. Okay, I'm going to depart, Madam Chair. Okay. You've gone through my sections and I have to go to another committee, unfortunately. Great, so. well, thank you. Thank you, really, and I'm sure we'll be back in touch. Sounds good, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, and I did, I should point out here actually in section three, I did define correctional officer as the same definition as in title 28. Mm -hmm. I forgot to, to add that, but again, that, that could be adjusted. Mm -hmm. as I mentioned. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right. So now we will transition to, help me with your first name, Amarin? Amarin Abergele. Okay, welcome. I haven't met you before. Nice to meet you. Yeah. So it's all yours. Just identify yourself for the record and then we'll go from there. Certainly. For the record, Amarin Abergele. I'm with the Office of Legislative Counsel, and I'm here to walk you through the section on cor the Corrections Misconduct Advisory Commission. Uh, I believe you all have a copy or can access the Downs Rockland Martin uh, report. So before I dive into section four, I just wanted to say that this section, it's my understanding I was not uh, a part of the committee discussion or prior testimony on this bill, but uh, it's my understanding that this request to create this commission was based off of a recommendation within that report. Uh, that is on page 51 of the report, if anyone would like to look into that. Um, I'm going to read just a brief piece of that so you have some context for what we've put in here for the bill. And again, I'm on page 51 of that report. DRM recommends that a monitoring committee of appropriate stakeholders be established to periodically monitor reporting of sexual misconduct, anti-retaliation policy, policy implementation and effectiveness, transparency, accountability, cultural impact of agency decisions, and to ensure that the determination of findings and if any disciplinary action is just and as intended. The monitoring committee shall be limited in size and they specify five to six members, and be comprised of institutional cross-agency stakeholders with broad perspectives, which must include some experienced in primary corrections. It is also recommended that the committee consider including a former judge with knowledge of the criminal justice system. So that's some background. You'll see that there's a lot of um, language missing in here. Uh, this is a draft for the committee's consideration. There are a number of policy decisions also that would need to be made to fill in some more of this information. But I will now walk you through what we have so far. 
So section four creates a new section 123 to title 28 called Corrections Misconduct Advisory Commission. This section creates the Corrections Misconduct Advisory Commission, which shall provide advice and counsel to the Commissioner of Corrections in carrying out his or her responsibilities at the Department of Corrections to monitor reporting of sexual misconduct, implement the department's anti-retaliation policy, create transparency, and implement policies relating to misconduct and review disciplinary action. Based on the recommendation in the report, we have put in uh, that the commission shall be composed of five members. <laughs> Thank you for the scrolling. Moving down onto the next page. We did include here for the fifth member, a former judge with knowledge of the criminal justice system uh, based on the recommendation in the report. But again, that is a policy decision. For powers and duties, we left those blank. Member terms, we have put in staggered terms of four years and included that a vacancy created before the expiration of a term shall be filled in the same manner as the original appointment for the unexpired portion. A member appointed to fill a vacancy created before the expiration of a term shall not be deemed to have served a term for the purposes of this subsection. Again, that is a choice for the committee uh, to make whether uh, serving the expiration, uh, excuse me, serving a partial term um, is considered to be a full term for purposes of limiting uh, how many terms a commission member may serve. Members of the commission shall be eligible for reappointment. However, members of the commission shall serve no more than two consecutive terms. We've included in here uh, some language about how a member may be removed. Again, this is another policy choice for the commission. Um, it could be removal for cause or the members could serve um, at the, um, uh, the commissioner could have control over members coming and going or the commission themselves could have a, have a say in when a member is removed from the committee. Moving down to page six, the commission shall select a chair from among its members at the first meeting. A majority of the membership shall constitute a forum, excuse me, a quorum. The commissioner's duties, the creation and existence of the commission shall not relieve the commissioner of his or her duties under the law to manage, supervise, and control the Department of Corrections. For reimbursement, members of the commission shall be entitled to receive per diem compensation and reimbursement for expenses in accordance with 32 VSA section 1010. Then I have section five, which is an implementation. We, is this the same? Are we talking about the same commission? Yes. Okay, okay, because I just didn't want to get off on a different topic. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Section five is session law uh, to implement the commission, particularly when you have commissions that are comprised of members that uh, have staggered terms uh, we put in session law to make sure that those terms are staggered from the start of the commission. We selected a start date of January 1st, 2022, not knowing when the committee would like this to be created. Um, that is in subsection A. Subsection B, members of the commission shall be appointed on or before, we have a blank date in here, in order to prepare as they deem necessary for the establishment of the commission. Um, and depending on what the duties are of the commission, that language may not be necessary. Uh, the terms of members shall officially begin on January 1st, 2022. In order to stagger the terms of the members, the initial terms of those members shall be as follows. And then following down on this page into the next page, you'll see that we've staggered the terms based on uh, four year, three year, two year, and one year um, at the start of the commission. And then as you'll see in subdivision two, after the expiration of the initial term set forth in subdivision one, commission members shall, uh, shall serve terms as set forth above, which is the four-year terms. And that is the end of this section, or excuse me, the language around establishing this commission. So I have a broad question, which is on <clears throat> page four, which is the beginning, which sets up the commission. I just want clarification. And the language is saying that the commission would provide advice and counsel to the commissioner in carrying out the duties, the Department of Corrections. 
who is going to be monitoring reporting of sexual misconduct, implement the department's anti-retaliation policy, create transparency and implement policies relating to misconduct and the review of dis disciplinary action. Is the way it's worded meaning that it's going to be this commission or is it a commissioner? The way it is currently worded, this would be a, an advisory commission, which would advise the commissioner in carrying out his or her duties to do those following things. That is how it is presently worded. So it would advise and give counsel to the commissioner when the commissioner is reporting sexual misconduct, when, when the, the commissioner is putting in anti-retaliation policy. That's yes. the intent. Okay, I just that want is to how it is. That is how it is uh, currently worded. Um, the the DRM report does not specify whether it should be whether the mm -hmm. commission should be more independent than that. Um, it was just a recommendation that there be a monitoring committee uh, to periodically monitor report excuse me, to periodically monitor the reporting of sexual misconduct, those um, policy implementation, um, looking at the determination of findings. And then this language in the bill would then have the commission providing advice and counsel to the commissioner on those areas. It just doesn't take away any powers of the commission, the commissioner. It just is an advisory and monitoring of how the commissioner is implementing his or her powers. Yes. Okay. Commissioner, did you want yeah, to say Madam something? Chair, yeah, just, I, 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 and again, it's the committee, but just a suggestion. Um, I, I don't really like misconduct in the middle of that. Um, you know, the original idea when we talked about this originally was following what SPAC does in the state police, the state police advisory commission. And so um, it's not really, it's not about, for me, the value of this commission would be, um, and you'll, you'll all decide this, the language, but putting folks that are on that commission that have backgrounds in equity, um, gender sensitivity, giving us guidance on those kind of things that we're doing, but also reporting our misconduct cases to them. So they have, so we have transparency on it and they're seeing what's going on and helping us put policies in place to impact that behavior. I don't know if I'm making sense to you or not, but I think calling it a misconduct <laughs> commission was not what we were thinking when we first talked about it. That's flagged. Thank you. Uh, Linda, then Scott. Um, so I have two questions. Um, as it's written under the advisory commission, looking at it that way, um, looking at review disciplinary action, et cetera, is that just in general terms how you might do disciplinary action or is that going to be specific to actual complaints? Because then I have questions, if that is true, I have questions as to legal privilege and things that go on. So if it's just an advisory uh, commission, would you just be talking about in, in a case like A, we would do B versus identifying who the, perpetrators maybe? So the way I envision this representative is that we have, we have an investigative process now. I discipline employees and we would report to that commission on a regular basis, the activity that's going on when it comes to misconduct and how we're disciplining folks. So, so redacting. They, we have transparency and that commission could say to me, and let me give you an example when I was the Colonel of State Police, right? The difference in what we're talking about here in SPAC, SPAC ran the internal affairs process. We have a different process here working with our partners at HR. But I would have to report as the Colonel every time the SPAC met about internal affairs cases. And if you had a, if you had a problem employee whose name kept coming up, 
that commission started asking questions that forced you as the leader of the organization, that that's, you know, if, if uh, Billy Smith's name comes up three months in a row um, about misconduct, um, you got to explain that to a commission. That's, that's the accountability transparency piece. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's kind of that gray line that I have some concerns about, but it's nothing that can't be fixed. But And then my other question is, had it been, say, a monitoring committee, that tells me that that recommendation, which I understood Down Strachman saying was that it should be an actual compliance of investigations. There should be a monitor over the compliance who then reported to you, which I personally would be more comfortable with. But that's, I just want to get the distinction to see if I was misunderstanding what was going on here. And we could talk about that later. I just wanted it to be clarified for me. Listen, Thank you. It, and for me, as the commissioner, it's not just the women's facility, it's across the system. That Okay. Madam Chair, okay. Yes, uh, Rep. Rep Dolan and I are supposed to go off to uh, this other meeting at 3.30. Should we, should we postpone that or? Who, you and Karen? Yes. Um, we've only got one other. Can you just hold off on that one to maybe quarter four? Would that be possible? Well, yeah, well, well, yeah, we'll let, let people know. Um, yeah, I think Karen has done that. Right, Karen? Yeah, I'll, I'll let them know. I know some people have to leave at four, so we'll just get done what we can get done. Yeah, okay. Yeah. This is taking a little longer than, unless one of you want, well, let's keep going. Any other questions? I mean, we might be able to finish it. Tanya, any questions? You all set? Okay, why don't we keep going? All right, moving on to section six. This section would add a new section 124 to title 28, creating a special investigations unit within the Department of Corrections. The purpose of the special investigations unit shall be to investigate complaints or allegations of criminal acts by persons under the custody of the commissioner or employees of the Department of Corrections. Uh, and also complaints or allegations against employees of the department uh, for misconduct, including constitutional or policy violations. The commissioner of corrections shall employ the proper staff and adopt the necessary procedures to carry out the duties of the special investigations unit and appoint a director who shall serve uh, to administer the activities of the unit. I will note that I believe the director position was something that we may have added in. I'm, I apologize, I was not here for the earlier discussions, but um, we added in a director in case that's necessary to create a new unit. Um, in subsection C at the beginning of page eight, the SIU shall have the jurisdiction and authority to investigate all complaints and allegations of criminal acts or misconduct at any state owned correctional facility. The SIU shall coordinate with state law enforcement agencies when violations of federal or state laws apply and the Department of Human Resources on employee misconduct investigations and disciplinary actions. And then in section seven, uh, again, this is more of an implementation uh, section would be to um, include uh, a provision that talks about where the position would come from if you were to include a director position for this special investigations unit. Questions? So Karen and Scott, I think you're gonna be able to make your 3.30 meeting, maybe. Okay, let's keep going. And actually, those are the only sections that I have knowledge of. I don't know if Bryn has arrived. I don't see her. But what this next section is, is two things. One is dealing with body cameras. That's section nine. And we're going to be working with Trevor on this for upstairs. And there may be some work also occurring with um, policy work in terms of 
the data that's collected, body cameras, and uh, who retains the data and what it's used for, because there's other policy, there's other initiatives in bringing in other folks having body cameras. Um, it was taken out of the appropriations budget adjustment. And so the issue is gonna be more encompassing with other entities besides corrections having body cameras. Um, but this is for correctional officers. Again, it's how you define correctional officers. Um, having body cameras or video devices on his or her person. And um, then it would be looking at the Department of Corrections would initiate the acquisition and deployment of the recording devices of the body cameras. And the ongoing cost of the devices that can't be accommodated within DOC's budget would it be included in their FY22 budget proposal. We are in FY22 budget proposal, and I think it's FY23 or budget adjustment. That has to be looked at. Um, so, oops, there's Bryn. And then the last piece is, of course, dealing with the, um, oh, it's a certification. Oh, okay. There's one piece that's missing. So, Representative Emmons, I am here. I'm sorry. Um, no, that's fine. We're, we just finished up to section nine. Okay. Um, oh, okay. The sexual exploitation. We didn't get into that one, section eight. And that's what the section I was looking for. So I have two members that have a 3.30 meeting. I would recommend you two members can scoot out to your meeting. I think that will be okay because we're towards the end of this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Yep. You Bye. too. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is like we're in the building. You leave one meeting early to get to another one late. <laughs> Only it's easier on Zoom. You just have to click. So um, let's transition to Bryn. Welcome, Bryn. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry for being late. I was in a, another Zoom and it took me a minute to transition over here. No, Trying that's to... fine. It's perfect timing. It's perfect. So Great. we are at Section 8, which is the sexual ex exploitation. And this is for folks who are not under direct supervision of uh, the, the offender is not okay. in the person's caseload. Yep. So for the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council, and I've got the remaining sections of the bill. Um, section eight is um, the, the crime that's set forth in Title 13 of sexual exploitation of an inmate. And according to the report, um, there was a, the report found that the prohibition, this criminal prohibition was really too narrow because as it, it exists right now, and if you scroll down um, a little bit, you'll see the language that's removed. The criminal prohibition is when an inmate um, and uh, a person who's supervising that inmate employed by the department are engaged in a sexual relationship where that employee is um, in a direct supervisory relationship with the inmate. So um, the report found that that was really uh, too narrow of a prohibition. And so what we've done here is we've struck that language that provides that um, there has to be that direct supervisory relationship in order for that conduct to be considered criminal. <clears throat> so as it as it's um as this reads then any person any correctional employee who engages in a relationship with an inmate um could be this could that could be criminal conduct under the statute questions so this would entail say a situation where a person was incarcerated and uh, then was out on furlough so now they're under supervision of a PMP officer, but a correctional officer could still be trying to um, engage with that previous, with a person that they um, built a relationship or knew while they were an inmate and are no longer incarcerated. So the person serving on furlough is no longer being directly supervised by that correctional officer that's working in the facility. That's 
the intent of this or vice versa could be someone that was supervised in the community by a PMP officer then the person becomes incarcerated and it's no longer on the caseload of the person who was in the field service office office so this is a house judiciary issue to be looked at i have a question by the way Kurt? Do, uh, do we have a definition of sexual act? Um, not, I don't, that's a good question. I'm not sure if we have one that reflects uh, this statute in particular. Um, but wait, just a moment. Oh yes, we do. So the sexual act means conduct between persons consisting of certain types of conduct. Um, if you'd like to read the statute, you can read it at... Uh, 13 BSA 3251 is definition number one. I can read it for the committee if you'd like. No. Okay. Okay, I can check it. Thank you. Since sure. we know where we can find it, section 3251. Subdivision one. Subdivision one. I knew there was another one there, but I wasn't sure. Okay. Anything else? Tanya, you all set? Okay. Section nine. Okay, so section nine, this um, adds a new statute to Title 28, which requires that the Department of Corrections equip all of its correctional officers. And I think that um, I've been listening a little bit on and off that you've been having conversations about this definition. Um, so it ensures that all correctional officers are equipped with a body camera or other video recording device on their person. Um, and so this language mirrors um, the language that was put into one of the police reform bills that passed last year requiring all law enforcement that are engaging with the public um, to be equipped with body cameras. So um, I'm not, not being certain if the, if the idea here was to equip everybody employed by the Department of Corrections or just those who are, who are supervising inmates. Um, I presumed it was the latter, so I put in um, correctional officers, but open, obviously I'll make a note if, if that needs to be changed. I'm gonna make a note, Bryn, because we're talking about that in terms of either drug testing or the polygraph. Do we mean just COs or are we meaning folks who are supervising them or are we meaning folks who are employees at the department? Madam Chair. Yes, I, Commissioner. Again, not, not the prolonging that you mm -hmm. all freed up on a Friday afternoon. I think when we talked about this originally, I'm talking corrections officers probably using that term in the planning process with the administration to secure the funding this year. We were talking about the greater definition of anybody who interacts or supervises either in a facility or in the field. Our intent is to start with the corrections officer and security staff inside and that would include supervisors and so on. <clears throat> but eventually, we would move towards the field when they're supervising individuals in the field. So you'd start small with the direct supervision in the facility and then gradually expand that. Right, on a roll. It would be phase in. It would be phase in. Correct. Correct. Okay, questions? Okay. I have a I, question. Oops, Sarah, I'm sorry, Kurt and then Sarah. Well, let, let Sarah go first there. Let me. Okay. Uh, Sarah? Thank you. Um, this might, we might need to get into this further later, but do we need to also um, develop the policy around the use of body cameras or is that? something that we would, that's is, that in, is that in our, that's in our committee's purview, correct? So Madam Chair, again, I, what I would propose to you is there is model policy being developed by public safety. Now, granted that is focused on law enforcement officers interacting with the public. We would take that policy and modify it to corrections with oversight from your committee or whoever you see, just like DPS is gonna bring that model policy into the legislature for approval. I think that's the intent of public safety, but I would suggest that we would work with you 
that you're comfortable with the policy. Yeah, this is going to be a big discussion. This isn't just us. This is other committees as well. This is a biggie. So Kurt and then Linda. My, my question was the same as um, Representative Coffey's. Okay, Linda. Um, so uh, Bryn, um, I'm trying to figure out just with this short language, how it would fall into compliance with public record laws and wiretapping laws. So body camera footage, that is gonna be part of what the policy provides. Um, body camera footage is, I mean, for public employees, for state employees is going to um, likely fall within an exemption to the Public Records Act. So it will be up to the policy to, um, sort out those details, which is um, why it's important to have a policy in place once officers are equipped with body cameras. Okay, quite other questions. Okay. Brian, you can finish us up. Okay, so the next uh, section, section 10, this is um, again, some language that mirrors the, the language that was put forth in the government operations bill last year about this immediate acquisition of devices. Um, so I don't know if this is necessary. I don't know how quickly the department wants to move on this, um, but the idea was to put in some session law that authorized them to immediately um, begin acquiring these body cameras and outfitting officers with them. Um, and then it provides some language about budgeting for them. Um, so the idea here before was that uh, the department should, any, any um, cameras that couldn't be purchased with the, the existing budget, um, the department was, was to come back and ask for it um, for next year's budget. So Bryn, I'm, that's on line two, page yep. include in the department's FY22 budget, shouldn't it be 23? Um, we're in that's right for next year. Yeah, so that should be 23. Yeah. Okay. Because that, that, or I was thinking budget adjustment, but so that, that leads to a question that we've been asking uh, both Mary and Kurt to work with Trevor. We know that there's a request, I believe the governor uh, has put money in the budget somewhere for body cams for DOC. Is it within your operating budget? that the governor has proposed, Commissioner? Because we can't, where is it? <laughs> I wish is it Matt there or is it not I, there? No, I wish, it's not in our operating budget. It's in his priority list. He's put Is it the one-time money? Correct. It's Correct. in the one-time, okay. So, so I, I, I'm, I wish Matt was here because I always miss the uh, budget terms, right? But, but, but it's in his priorities and the governor's priorities on his one times. Okay, and is there any yeah, language? That, Alice, right? that's what we got. That was what we got as well. So is there policy written around that or is that just just the money to acquire the body cams? Just the, the money to acquire the body cams. Okay, that's helpful to know. And do you know the mm -hmm. amount that was put one, in? One million. Just one million. One million. And how many body cams do you think you can get for one million? You, you know, I, I, I don't. I don't have the breakdown here in front of me, but it pretty much covers just about what we need to roll out throughout the operation, to include the facilities and district offices. Okay. But again, being a big project, obviously, it's going to take time to roll that out. That's why I said earlier, you know, we would start with the correction facilities and, and go to Representative Sull Sullivan's um, question about consent, right? Um, so, because that's really what you're saying, Representative, about consent. Where consent would come into play for us is when a probation or parole officer is visiting someone in the field, because inside the facilities, that's not the issue, right? Because again, we have cameras all over the facilities already, um, but, this is to get much better uh, interaction between our staff and incarcerated individuals. 
Okay, Linda? Uh, thank you for that clarification. That was my question. So my other question is the million dollars is for the purchase of the cams. What about then the cost of storage, retrieving them, the redacting of video footage? Is that going to be above and beyond the million to kick off? So for the first year, that figure included the estimates that we got um, from various vendors for storage for the first year. Obviously, after that, you got reoccurring costs on storage. But what I will say is that prior to the session starting, we had a collaboration meeting with the administration where the other folks that are looking for body cameras met with Secretary Quinn to talk about a more holistic look at how you would do storage in order to save and how you would do retrieval on a holistic approach so you would not be doing one-offs on storage and retrieval. You have questions from the committee? Uh, Michelle? Um, yeah, I have a quick question. I've heard of other states where the police uh, police officers do use body cameras and at times there have been altercations and then they say, oh, my body camera was turned off. So I'm wondering, do we need to have some kind of language about if you have a body camera, when, when and how you need to use it to make sure that people comply with the expectation of using it? You know, Representative, I think, you know, I have a good deal of experience prior to getting here on body camera policy across the country. And it, every policy talks about when you should have it on and off. And so what I would suggest to you is, is that that's a policy, um, that's policy language that directs people when to do it. And, and I, I can almost guarantee in those cases you've heard, they're in violation of their policy, right? So, uh, you know, Again, I, I'm not saying one way or the other, but what I'm saying is typically you handle that in policy and then it's disciplined as a result of failure to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else on this? Tanya, do you have a question? No? Okay. Next section, 11. Okay. So the last section um, is a session law directive. Um, this is a, so the idea here is to um, transfer the responsibility or the authority of um, certifying and decertifying uh, correctional officers to the Criminal Justice Council. Um, so under, under the statutes um, governing the Criminal Justice Council now, they are um, responsible for maintaining uniform standards of basic training for law enforcement and in-service training for law enforcement and maintaining statewide standards for law enforcement professional conduct. And they do that by um, a, a, a host of responsibilities that they have for law enforcement officers, including training and including investigating misconduct and um, imposing administrative penalties. Um, so the idea here is um, because the Criminal Justice Council's authority would have to be amended to include um, de Department of the Corrections officers um, or employees, that uh, this directs the council and the department to get together um, and come up with a proposal for um, how the council would be responsible for um, the certification and decertification of um, correctional officers, and also how they would have the authority to investigate allegations of misconduct. Um, and it directs them to give a report to the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee um, by December of this year. So then members of that committee could introduce legislation um, following those recommendations of, of the council and the department. So this is a way of not having the fox guarding the hen house, so to speak, right? Where you have a neutral party being able to investigate allegations of any misconduct from correctional officers. And if there needs to be a decertification that that's done outside of the powers and duties of the commissioner of corrections, correct? 
that's what the goal is. But the question is, how do you get there? And that's what this language does is to come back with a report with some okay. initiatives. Because it's not under the jurisdiction of the Criminal Justice Council at this point, correctional officers are not. The training of correctional officers is not under the jurisdiction of the Criminal Justice Council. That's correct. The commissioner can authorize and designate a correctional officer to um, become certified by the council as a law enforcement officer, but in general, no. Because the Criminal Justice Council deals with folks who are law enforcement officers. That's correct. And the definition of law enforcement officer within the council, the chapter on the council does not include um, correctional officers. Okay. Madam Chair, if it helps, I, 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 uh, I like the approach that Bryn has taken as far as stepping back and coming up with a process instead of putting that process on you. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that, makes, that makes sense to me because it is, we are chartering new course here. But mm -hmm. I would remind, I mean, I think the difference now, the scope of what goes on at Pittsford is now the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, not the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. And even though we do not fit into law enforcement, we are part of the criminal justice system. And I think that's an important piece. And so <laughs> I, I, I do like this approach from, from the, you know, that we, we work with the Criminal Justice Council to come up with a plan on how we would do this instead of just dumping on them that they're gonna take this on. I think that's a, a reasonable approach. I'm just thinking down the road, Commissioner, do we then train our correctional officers at the academy? Because <laughs> I know some people want that to happen. Listen, I, I uh, you know, I, I don't want to jump too far here. We got a lot going on, yeah. but I understand why we ended up in Lindenville, why we're there. And I'm not being disrespectful to Lindenville or my friends up in that part of the country, Northeast, going up towards the Northeast Kingdom. But I really do believe at some point, um, corrections should be at the academy where they used to be. And they were quite a while ago. Yes, they were. Just you know, thing. I don't think I don't think most people up in the Northeast Kingdom even know that it exists. I, I know that, Representative. I wanted to make sure I was being respectful to you, ma'am. I know, but I didn't know it existed when I came. You know, was put on this committee, and then they said up Lindenville, and I'm like, where? Right. <laughs> but I don't think most people even know it exists. It, so it, if you it, ended no. up moving it, it would, yeah. they wouldn't even know. They, you know, they they had to make a quick decision where to go after Irene. You know, after okay. after the facility got you know, damage with the rest of the state complex. Um, but as that, as the training, or as, as the Criminal Justice Council moves towards more to a global justice center for justice issues, I think it's the proper place for corrections to go to. But that's gonna take some planning. Well, it may also take some renovations down there at the Academy in Pittsburgh. Right, right. <laughs> and there yeah, is money in the Capitol bill for a feasibility study to kind of figure out what they do, but it's for the police academy. And I was there in 2010 and 2011. They, they left just before that. Yeah. Anything else for Bryn before we yep, start? I have my hands up. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have the participant list up. I'm sorry. Kurt. Um, I just wanted to make sure he uh, maybe... Commissioner can answer. Is this is this specific enough with regard to who's doing this? I mean, is it enough to say Criminal Justice Council and Department of Corrections go off and do this, or do you need more specific direction than that? No, I, I don't think so. As long as I, 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 I can't believe I'm about ready to say what I'm going to say, Representative. Um, direct us to come back and report to you in a report, right? I'm normally pushing back against reports, but I'm holding us accountable to come back with a plan to you in the form of reporting back to the, to the committee. Okay. Sarah? So I know it's late and I just, I, was, um, I think having all the attorneys work on this together mm -hmm. is pretty impressive and it shows how complicated this 
that what we're trying to do is. So I just, I wanted to, I, and I think we'll probably come back to it. So this question really is for, for you, Madam Chair, um, what our process is gonna be around this. Cause I, I do have a number of questions about some of the, specifically around the, the, um, the role of the um, advisory committee in contrast to the recommendation of the um, Downs Rackland report for it to be a monitoring committee. And I just wanna make, have some, make sure that we have some time to discuss that. It doesn't seem like today at four o'clock mm -hmm. is the time. No, this is it. the first walkthrough. Yeah. So I just want to say that it, this is realizing as this is really complex. So this is, um, I'm appreciative that we're making the time to do this and all the, the, the commissioner wants to, us uh, is supportive of this and all the attorneys who worked on this. It's pretty complicated. It's very complicated. It's going to involve many of our colleagues. So, Amarin, what committee or what topic do you staff? Do you basically work with um, topics, policy issues from government operations? Yes, that's correct, government operations. Okay, so you deal with, with commissions and boards, boards and commissions and that type of thing. Yes. For this, and then Damien deals with employment issues with general and um, body camps is gonna be involving maybe Judiciary Committee and the criminalization of non-direct supervision is gonna be Judiciary Committee. So we're gonna be reaching out to all sorts of folks. It's just figuring out how we're gonna proceed in working on this. And I need to spend some time thinking. I know I've sent out feelers to the chair of GovOps and also Judiciary. Um, I'm gonna reach out to the chair of General and I think what we need to do as a committee is figure out what sections we start taking testimony on um, and um, figure out who we want to come in to testify and look at it through a corrections lens, but some of the other committees are gonna have to look at it through their lens. And then we meld that together. And I know that's, pretty mushy for some of the folks who are new to this process, but that's what happens as we work through legislation. Um, so what's the best way for the council, Ledge Council, when we start taking up a particular section to make, to check on, on your availability because I know, Bryn, you're tied up mostly in the morning, correct? You're tied up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, I mean, we all, you know, everyone is. Um, yeah. So I think that it makes the most sense to, um, we've divided it into sections. So Damien, I think, has the first two or three, and Amarin has the next three, and I have the last four, I think. Um, so, and and I can get a list to fill so he can depending on what sections you're working on, um, you can, he can invite whichever one of us corresponds to the language. Right, and that will be helpful. Um, I mean, I'm assuming the committee wants to do work on this bill. Am I getting nods, yes or no? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. So the other thing too, the specific sections that pertain to other committees, we'll have to get those out at least to the chairs so they can figure out how they wanna go from there too, from their lens. Well, our lens is gonna be through DOC's world. Their lens is gonna be through their world of employment and their world of setting up boards and commissions and their world of criminalizing uh, behavior. That makes sense to folks? Okay, well, let's call it a wrap for the week. Um, Bryn, Amron, I'm gonna have trouble with your name. I know that. <laughs> so thank you and, Beach, and DOC, thank you. We'll get you back in, I'm sure. And then we're done for today on live stream. So I wanna thank you folks. This was our first walkthrough and um, we got some work ahead of us. So. Thank you for YouTubing.